Good morning. Thank you for joining me again. I hope you had a lovely weekend this weekend. We will spare the rain. I think where I live, we just got a drizzle on Monday. And generally, you know, around Diwali time, we get some rain and we were spared this time. So I hope you had, first of all, a happy and peaceful and holy Diwali, if you celebrate Diwali. And secondly, uh, if you participated because you liked the festival, I hope you had an enjoyable time. And thirdly, if you just rested or had a good time for the weekend, I hope you had a good time. I hope, hope you had a nice weekend. Uh, this morning, I want to deal with some economic issues. And on that score, on that note, I want to thank those of you who looked at my budget presentation, which I posted on Facebook. I myself do not believe how many people actually looked at that. I, this morning, I looked at the numbers and it was over 19,000, close to 20,000 people actually looked at my budget presentation. So I want to thank you very much. I hope you found it valuable. Everything in there is based on fact and information. And the criticisms of the Minister of Finance and the government are legitimate. There are real issues with the numbers and there are real problems with the linking of uh, budgetary measures and allocations and the policy of the government. So I hope you found my presentation useful and I hope you found it valuable. This morning I want to continue on that vein. Um, first with the budget and secondly on economic matters and then as I usually do, I will talk for a few minutes, maybe 20 minutes, 25 minutes. And then after that, your questions are, um, are the most valuable thing. Because I will, try to I will try to answer your questions. Because if you ask questions, it means that these things are on your mind. And as long as I can answer them, I will answer them. If I can't answer them, or if I don't know, I will tell you straight. I won't try to... Uh, mesmerize you with nonsense. I don't want to do that. Um, the, the, the first problem I have with the budget, you know, uh, after the debate in the House of Representatives, is that the Minister of Finance uh, gave a very poor wind-up to the budget. As you know, what happened on that occasion is that the government was trying to keep a, close to a dozen speakers so that they could go one after the other. And uh, in their loose way, um, speak as a government on various matters, including the chastising of the opposition. And we had three speakers remaining for the UNC and we refused to get up and speak so that they would bombard us in the way that they were planning. And the end result was that the Minister of Finance closed the budget debate. He did not speak for very long and there was absolutely no substance, little or no substance. He addressed none of the policy measures raised by the leader of the opposition. Uh, and as you would remember, she gave a three-hour policy speech. Um, and he addressed none of the criticisms that I made and the substantial challenges to many of the things that he asserted in the budget. He chose the, the opportunity to make some kind of foolish remark about calculation of the GDP, which is neither here nor there. The point is that the GDP has fallen uh, it is now 91% of what it was in 2015, and that is a reality. And the truth is that the debt is exceptionally high and growing. When you check all the debt, it is over $150 billion. And when you take the official debt, 
as recorded by the central bank, it is $102 billion. And the GDP is falling, nominal or otherwise, it is falling. And therefore, the, the, the debt is growing and the debt to GDP um, uh, ratio remains a challenge for the country. Uh, and the minister said very little else. He had very little to say of substance. He did not reply to anything. He tried to dismiss the, um, the positions articulated by members of the opposition, but he himself had nothing to say. And then he did not go into the Senate to do a proper presentation. And even the winding up was done by the junior minister, who is the minister of public administration. So in a way, he did not take this particular budget debate seriously. And I can understand why he avoided any kind of engagement, because this is a horrible budget. The budget has no basis in reality. In my view, all the numbers are wrong. All the projections are false. All the numbers that he used in the past had to be revised. And we're in a situation in which we have had three consecutive years of negative growth, despite their predictions of growth uh, in 2019. It did not happen. So we are in a recession. We are really in a bad way. And there, there, I mean, there are real problems. All the numbers that he projects for the future, the one point. 7% growth that he talks about that the, um, that the CSO um, indicates for the first quarter of um, 2019. I mean, that is debatable, that's questionable. When you take the fact that it will take some time, even if all goes right with the OWTU and Patriotic and Petrotrin, it will take some time for that to come on stream. When you take into account the fact that the oil production is extremely low, the lowest it has been for a long time. When you take the fact that even though there has been some growth in gas, it is not likely to grow to the extent that the government is talking about, they will not meet their targets. And when you take the fact that they have been very uh, optimistic in determining the price of um, natural gas for the budget and when you take into, a, the fa into account the fact that there is very little happening in the non-energy sector in terms of investment, in terms of diversification, in terms of growth, uh, their numbers are just not credible. And um, the, the, I mean everything, every piece of information that we have, the assessment by Moody's, the assessment by Standard and Poor's, the minister says that Fitch gave him a positive report, but it's private, not public. I mean, it defies what you might call credibility. Um, and when you look at the numbers of the World Bank, when you look at the numbers of the IMF, when you look at the fact that they did not invite the IMF to come and do their Article 4 uh, consultation, I mean, any growth project projection that the minister makes has to be taken with a grain of salt, perhaps with a, with a pound of salt. And the minister is just misleading the country, which is not right for Trinidad and Tobago. He's painting a picture that is fairly rosy, and the reality of the situation is not so. The numbers do not add up, they do not make sense. And when you look at the situation on the ground, people trying to put food on their table, People threatened with loss of jobs, uh, you an industrial relations situation looming now with the rise in the pay for CPEP, the rise of the minimum wage and the 15% and the increase. Uh, it is all well and good to do that for the workers and we are happy for them. But the point is that the government, just as they are doing with the numbers, they are doing all of these things without policy context. 
what are they doing in terms of production and productivity, what are they doing in terms of diversification of exports, what are they doing in terms of export growth, how are they going to earn the foreign exchange, uh, how are, I mean, there are so many questions, my brothers and sisters. I, I think we have a runaway minister of finance here, and um, while he is wrecking the country, he is telling us that the, that the bull full, and as soon as the calf is, um, is born, we can go and milk the bull. I mean, it is really outrageous what is happening in terms of the government's um, misinformation that they are providing to the country. And there are other areas for concern, there are other causes of concern, the continuing fiscal deficits. We understand that because they cannot bring spending into line with the revenues which have fallen. Um, there is an increase in transfers and subsidies which they now have to sustain. Uh, the cumulative fiscal def deficit uh, as articulated by the Minister of Finance himself is 36 billion if we take his numbers. We are m among the worst in the world in terms of um, growth performance. Uh, with countries like Chad and the Republic of the Kong Congo and Iraq and Lesotho. Those are the countries that we are in company with in terms of the growth uh, performance of Trinidad and Tobago. I mean, that is company you don't want to keep when it comes to the issue of growth and economic well-being. Uh, all the growth projections, as I said, are suspect. Uh, the, in, in addition, you know, the Minister of Finance, the Ministry of Finance, have now taken on the responsibility for growth projections in the country. The CSO is not going to do that anymore. The Minister explained it by saying that it is best practice and so on. I don't know um, if it is best practice. What I do know is that the Ministry of Finance is now, has now taken charge of the growth projections. What I do know is that the IMF has not been invited for an Article 4 consultation and is now over a month later than they were supposed, since they were supposed to be here. Um, he talks about Fitch's report, which is private, uh, but it is a good report. And we have the Fitch Solutions report on the state of the economy, which is not good at all. Everything that it says, uh, says that the economy is weak, that our dollar is overvalued, that we are seeing no growth, that no diversification is taking place, uh, and that our debt situation is something to be troubled about. And then Fit Solutions also did a report this is the same Fitch that he said had such a good report for Trinidad and Tobago, which is private and which he cannot disclose yet. Um, Fitch Solutions also did a report on the natural gas sector in Trinidad and the prospects. And that belies everything that the minister is telling us in terms of projection for growth and their reliance on uh, energy, mostly natural gas in order to keep us going in a sustainable way. So we have a real problem. And the problem for the government is credibility. And the problem for the country is bracing for the um, inevitable, given the realities of the numbers which the government is not willing to share with us in an honest way. The unemployment figures are suspect. Um, the leader of the opposition claims that over 50,000 jobs have been lost, perhaps more. She used a figure of 67,000. Let us say it's just 50,000 50, people who have lost their job. That's a real problem. And the labor force participation rate is 58.7, which is extremely low, which means that people 
have stopped looking for jobs and those who are looking are not getting. Um, and I don't know that um, I don't know that any of the measures, the fiscal measures that have been proposed by the government, uh, whether they are incentives, whether they are wage increases, um, whether they are um, other economic measures on which they were very sparse, I do not know if those things are going to make a difference in the country. And my brothers and sisters, I think after the budget we will begin to see that there might be some government spending, but there will be no sustainable development of Trinidad and Tobago as we go into an election season with local government and as we go into a national election season, uh, perhaps in 2020. The summary position for Trinidad and Tobago is that economically we are not doing well, financially we are not doing well, um, in terms of job creation, we are not doing well. In terms of exports, we are not doing well. In terms of competitiveness, we are not doing well. In terms of ease of doing business, we are not doing well. In terms of productivity, we are not doing well. In terms of job creation, we are not doing well. In terms of investment and growth and diversification, we are not doing well. So what has happened is that the government has thrown the country into recession since 2016 and basically they have crashed the economy and there is nothing in the form of a stimulus that we can see that is going to make a difference in terms of economic recovery, growth, job creation and make a difference uh, to the fortunes of people in the country. So I stop at this point and I ask you for your questions. And I'll be happy to answer any of the questions you ask as long as I can answer them. As I said, if I can't answer them, I'll be honest with you and tell you that I can't. Or check on them and come back and answer at some other point. Um, but if I can answer them, of course, I will share my thoughts with you. Thank you very, very much for listening to me this morning. Okay. Dr. Tiwari, we have a question. It says, the opposition leader recently declared that she will reopen Petrochim granted that she becomes Prime Minister. How difficult will this be, granted the existence of shady deals between the Union and the government? And do you think this makes sense from a financial position? The, um, the, petro, the, the restoration of Petrotrin as a productive entity, that is to say the, the refinery, makes sense uh, for several reasons. One, given that various governments, the Manning regime and the Kamala Prasad Bissessa government of which I was part, spent a significant amount of money on the petrochemical refinery to keep it going. All right? Secondly, the Without the petrochemical refinery uh, running, it means that we have to find foreign exchange to import fuel into Trinidad and Tobago that we could otherwise produce with the petrochemical refinery. Okay? So if the refinery is operating, it means that all of these things that we have to find foreign exchange to import will now be available uh, through local, pro a local production system with the refinery to supply uh, various fuels to Trinidad and Tobago. So that's the second thing. The third thing is that if the refinery is operating, you are going to get jobs. You're going to, even if you don't employ the nearly 10,000 people who have been affected by the closure of, of ref the refinery, let's say you even hire just 4,000 people. Uh, that would be important. It means 4,000 jobs would be created and the refinery would be going and that would be very, very good for the country. Um, and finally, because of the fact that they have now, uh, they have now basically posted a bond for the debt 
that was due in 2019 and 2020. Uh, what it means that the refinery itself does not carry that debt. It is the heritage system that carries that debt. And to the extent that that debt remains, it is also a debt for which the government will be liable since these are all state enterprises. In the end, should heritage fail as an entity so that Petrotrin, the refinery, will not have to basically contribute to the debt servicing. Okay, so for all those reasons, it makes sense to get Petrotrin going. The issues you raise with the OWTU are a different issue. You know, we have no problem with the union owning the refinery or anything else in the country. I mean, remember one of the major platforms of the UNC is employee share ownership, both in the public and the private sector. And we would be happy for employees to own shares in companies in the country because it gives them a bit bigger stake. It makes for employee loyalty. It makes for higher productivity. So we have no problem with those kinds of things. The problem, though, that we have is that we cannot see what are the financial arrangements all right, that attend the relationship between the government and Patriotic, the company. Patriotic, the company, which is a union-owned company, does not have the finance. They'll have to get somebody to help them with the finance. And we don't know what are the terms and conditions because the government has an arrangement with Patriotic. But all the other arrangements will, be ha will have to be made by Patriotic with other entities. And the danger in all of that is that if somebody does not secure the national interest, the, we may very well as taxpayers end up being saddled with all the debt that might be accrued to run the Petrotrin refinery by Patriotic and their partners should that fail. All right? So that's the other issue. And then the third thing is that we do not know, based on the allegations that are in the public domain, whether there is some kind of secret arrangement between members of the government uh, and the OWTU and other private players in the system uh, against whom allegations of corruption have been made. So these things are things that one has to be very careful about. So that is at once the opportunity and the um, challenge and difficulty of the Petrodrin deal. But to get Petrodrin, the refinery, up and running again, is something that I think would be desirable. The problem is, what is the nature of the deal and who will pay the cost ultimately? Okay, I hope that is helpful. Another question asks, do you think our economy needs deleveraging? Is what? Do you think our economy needs deleveraging? I, I, I don't answer, I don't follow the question. Question six, do you need do you think our economy needs deleveraging in terms of reducing the debt? Is, well if you mean if you mean whether our debt is too high and we need to do something, listen, this thing is a any development strategy for a country is a simultaneous equation. You have to do many things at once. Okay? You have to address the, the issue, I mean, given our energy situation, we have to optimize the energy situation to get as much foreign exchange as possible. So that means you have to finalize the fiscal measures to allow the companies to drill, because if you do not allow them to drill, you wouldn't have any more gas except what you have now from truck and Angelin and juniper and so on you will not have any new gas so you have to get them to drill now so that you have gas in 2022 23 24 up to 2030 you know 
So the first thing is that you have to solve the problems of the energy sector. You have to solve the problems of fiscal measures that will be attractive. Um, the government has solved the problem of upstream. I don't think they've solved the problem of downstream. I think we have a number of methanol plants that are not operating at full capacity. I think you still have downstream issues. The future of NGC and its role, I don't think that has been settled. So the energy sector needs to be resolved, right? Because always when you're trying to solve a problem, you have to solve the production side and the revenue side, uh, even as you address the other issues. The second thing is that you need to export outside of the energy sector. And nothing that the government is doing is expanding exports outside of the energy sector. So this is a real problem. You need investment, you need growth, you need expansion, you need more, um, more, uh, what you call it, um, you need more workers in the system from shifts, you need more shifts, okay? So uh, in the manufacturing sector, you need export in the services sector, you need those things. And then you need more new investments in areas that are vital today, you know, driven by science, technology, given to innovation, given to things like a fourth industrial revolution, uh, things like artificial intelligence. You need to move up the value chain, absorb the technology and move on. You need also to absorb your tertiary graduates coming out of the tertiary sector from UE, from UGT, from Postat, all of those all of those entities. But in addition to all of these things, you have a situation in which if you don't have exports for foreign exchange, if you don't have a secure gas sector for a long period of time, uh, and happy players in the energy sector, if you don't have growth in the economy and job creation, and therefore an improvement of the tax base, both in terms of workers and in terms of businesses who are willing to pay taxes, if you do not have those things, then you can't keep racking up the debt because the issue is how are you going to pay for it? If you rack up the debt and you have no growth, the current percentage of revenue that debt takes in terms of repayment in Trinidad and Tobago is 17.5%. That is a significant amount. So the issue is not just debt, is whether you can pay. And therefore, as I said, it's a simultaneous equation. You cannot just address the debt situation and say not to borrow anymore or stop borrowing because you need to do things, you need to have money to spend. It's a simultaneous equation in which you have to solve the problem of the energy sector, the non-energy sector, the export growth, the the confidence that is required for new investment, the confidence that is required for small businesses to pick up, the, confi the consumer confidence that is required to get people to spend so the economy grows. It's all of those things. So at the end of the day, your debt situation can improve, your revenue situation can improve with taxes, and you're in a better position to function. Okay. Another question asked, with the recent erection of a Chinatown sign in Port of Spain, do you think this is an act of pacification to entrench ourselves further with the Chinese government in an attempt to get further concessions? I don't know what the thinking is, but I think uh, if you're talking about the big issue, I think we should be concerned. If we should be concerned about debt in general and our ability to repay, I think we should be concerned about debt with the Chinese and the terms and conditions we have with them because the Chinese will accept a takeover of your assets if you are unable to pay. So I think that negotiations with the Chinese as a government 
uh, and even relationship with the private sector because China is not a country in which the private sector is absolutely and distinctly um, disconnected from the state and from the Chinese government. I think those things should be some things that we should be very cautious about and navigate in a certain way. The Chinatown thing, I don't know what is the prompting for that. The articulated position is that they want to twin with the city of Shanghai. Shanghai is a highly developed city, one of the modern cities in China. And Port of Spain is a dying city because no investment is being made in Port of Spain. And the city is deteriorating because of the crime situation and so on. And I don't think that establishing a Chinatown is going to change that. I think you need a whole set of rehabilitative investments and an infusion and injection of investments in the city and a transformation of the city in order to do that. When we were in office, we were thinking of development of 11% of the Shagaramas Peninsula, tying that in with both transportation and a highway, um, a causeway to Shagaramas, developing Invaders Bay so that you could create construction work, developing East Port of Spain so that we could create the conditions for attraction there, uh, creating the conditions in, in Port of Spain so that you can have a city not just with business and commerce but with safety and residential and commercial interests uh, established in Port of Spain. And we had done a port study in which we were thinking of what we would do with the Port of Spain port together with dry docking facilities in La Brie. Uh, so the idea was to take your center city, your main city, your capital city, and try and develop that as a residential city because people are moving out of Port of Spain into other areas. Port of Spain is becoming a smaller city in terms of population. And there's a significant kind of rehabilitation and reinvestment and rejuvenation that takes place, that needs to take place in Port of Spain. I don't know that Chinatown is going to do that. If it's the beginning of a larger plan, it may make sense. But I want to say this. I simply say this in passing, you know, Trinidad and Tobago has never had a Chinatown. But we have had Chinese in Trinidad and Tobago, starting with Indenture, since the 1840s. And one of the significant things about Trinidad and Tobago is that you always had a well-integrated Chinese community. You had the Chinese associations, I think that there are about four or five in Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, uh, but you, the Chinese were always a small minority that integrated well, that became involved in business, starting with the shops and the corners, etc., and going into the professions, going into banking, being contributing citizens, well integrated in Trinidad and Tobago society, intermarrying with the rest of the community, developing business, etc. And there never was a Chinese town. Chinese was simply part of Trinidad and Tobago society. Now this thing is a new invention and it is based on recent Chinese immigration, which is very, very different from the immigration that has taken place up to well into the 1970s and 80s in Trinidad and Tobago from China. So I don't know what this will imply now. And this may very well have to do with Chinese economic and diaspora and foreign uh, relations strategy, external strategy for the government of China that it has anything to do with the development of Port of Spain or the interests of the people of Trinidad and Tobago and interest in the city of Port of Spain and its development. I simply mention that as a word of caution. I think the fact that we never had a Chinatown town in Trinidad and Tobago and a very well integrated, uh, very highly contributive Chinese community in Trinidad and Tobago is a plus, not a minus. It is an asset, not a liability. 
And I think to impose the concept of Chinatown here now in city of Port of Spain, it's something that we need to reflect upon because it's related to the new immigration and to the new thrust of China across the world uh, rather than with anything having to do with Trinidad and Tobago, the city of Port of Spain or the government and people of Trinidad and Tobago. Dr. Tiwari, generally in promoting a viable silver economy, there's a gap in that persons are bound to retire at age 60 and reaches a pensionable age at age 65. What do you think can be done to financially secure persons between ages 60 and 65? I think we have to, I mean, people are living longer now, they are healthier now. And even when they have diseases that are prevalent in Trinidad and Tobago, like diabetes, uh, heart disease, um, uh, those are the most prevalent. There are others, of course, that make it harder to function. But even with diabetes, hypertension, and heart disease, people can continue to work and function with medication and live a very productive life. You know, if you have renal disease or if you have cancer, it's much more difficult uh, for you to function depending on the stage of cancer. But even with cancer, people are able to manage with chemotherapy and other uh, forms of, of, um, of medication that allow them to function. So I think what we need to do is to really try to tap into that silver economy. I think it is possible to do a number of things. I'll just mention two or three things. There are lots of youth issues in the country uh, in the school system, outside of the school system, in the urban areas, in the summer areas, in the rural areas. I think the older population, above 60, um, people are living now into their 90s. They are quite functional up to the age of 80 and strong. Uh, I think that we can do things that bring youth and elderly, skilled and professional people together in a constructive and productive relationship that can be of value in the society in a sustainable way. So that's one thing. The second thing is that I believe we can build an international, um, internationally attractive tourism industry that's related to health and uh, caregiving uh, of a certain kind maybe using the ocean fronts in various parts of the country, not the very uh, popular areas that we have now uh, that are used by the local population and are seen as resorts by people who are outside, but along of the, the coast of Mayaro, in areas such as Maruga, in areas such as um, Ikakas, in areas uh, in different parts of the country, it is possible to have seaside living and caregiving and interaction between older people in a constructive way that has commercial possibilities for Trinidad and Tobago. And these things can be supported by doctors and healthcare institutions and hospitals and so on. Uh, that allow relatively healthy people to be properly taken care of and a relationship between international visitors uh, who can spend some of their time here and local older people who can be part of that process. So I mentioned just those two. It is possible to create a silver economy of that kind. And once you do that, there are all kinds of, of um, facilities that can develop. I mean, you have to do barbering facilities. I mean, those are things that can develop and can be uh, a very happy, um, non-institutionalized kind of format. Um, you, I mean, people have to have their meals during the day. You have different ways of doing that, whether it's restaurants, whether it's delivery, uh, things like that. Um, People need to go for walks. 
all right you could walk on the beach may have a long long stretch of beach for instance and you have long stretches of beaches in different parts of the country so there there are many many things that you can do if you have a little imagination mm -hmm. another question asks the local government election has been called on the 2nd of december and since then we have not seen an aggressive election campaigning from the opposition apart from the monday night forum and the recently introduced pavement report do we expect to see a more vehement campaigning and how important is it to secure a resounding victory? Yes, the victory depends on the people. If the people come out and vote, and they vote as I think they should, which is that this government has failed after all their promises, they have failed the people and the economy, then they, if they come out to vote, they should vote, register their vote against the government. And if they vote for the opposition, that will help us to win a victory. So the most important thing is for people to come out, people to express their, um, their dissatisfaction with the current way that the government is proceeding and to, for people to vote for the opposition. The um, campaign has not been aggressive because it was called at a time when we went straight into the Diwali season and the official nomination will not take place. That is to say the registration of the candidates as official candidates for the UNC will not take place until the 10th, I think, or the 11th. Uh, and once that is done and the candidates are offered to the country, then we will have a, a vigorous campaign going on of a public nature. But the campaign has been going on. People have been out in the communities, talking to people in their homes, in their villages, in their communities, etc. Uh, in my own constituency this evening, I'm having a meeting with the activists who are going to be part of the campaign in the Londonville, Edinburgh uh, constituency. Our candidate there is Mary Correa. And on Wednesday evening, I'm having a meeting with the activists that are going to be involved in the freeport Chiklan constituency, where the candidate is Anil Baliram. And after those two meetings, we are going to be out in the field every day, uh, while the campaign that is national um, begins to organize itself so that we can bring issues to the country at large. So we are very ready, we are very prepared. We are being organized now. We uh, let the Diwali season pass with only uh, soft campaigning in the communities. And we are going to be much more aggressive now, and especially after the 10th, uh, when the candidates are formally announced to the country. The next question states, do you think the Minister of National Security is deluded in that he focuses on trivial issues such as his concerns over fishermen's ability to gather ransom money and lack focus on dealing with the ongoing issue, failing to secure them whilst out at sea? Yes, I, well I think the government is, I mean, I don't think they're delusional. I, I think it's just a strategy of distraction. They raise all kinds of spurious issues, hoping to get you into an argument about those things. So while the country is going to hell, and it really is very, very unfair to the country. It is very disingenu disingenu disingenuous for the government to proceed in that matter. And it really is horrible and the opposition should not get involved in that kind of thing. The mother of one of the boys who was killed uh, out at sea in central Trinidad, you know, the Cali Bay area, had to come out and say, my son was not involved in drugs. The fishermen of the sea came out and said, these boys died with their Tolta boots doing their work, you know, trying to make a living. And uh, I don't know where the Minister of National Security gets his information from, but whatever information he gets, I think he should be more judicious. And when he starts getting the murder rate 
down when he starts getting the murder calm down and when he starts prosecuting more criminals and gets the justice system to work it is then that he probably will earn the right and the freedom to speak right now he has very little right to speak given the state of the country and the state of crime in the country so this is our last question it states parts of the sustainable development speaks to environmental integrity however we continue to see indiscriminatory degradation of the environment for the sake of capital development if the unc is successful in the next general election can you give the assurance that environmental laws are revamped and comes with serious consequences if broken yes yes i can give that assurance and the reason is very simple we you would remember that our the ministry which i led um, because of the graciousness of the honorable prime minister mrs kamala Prasad bisessa when we were in office from 2010 to 2015 was called the ministry of planning and sustainable development because we were committed to the business of sustainable development. And in 2013, we had a delegation. I did not go, but my permanent secretary went and other representatives went in Rio, Brazil, at the um, Rio Plus um, 20 conference. Um, and we presented Trinidad and Tobago's uh, commitments internationally uh, on the issue of environmental considerations. Um, we presented where we had reached in terms of meeting our obligations and what remained outstanding. And we also presented what we were committed to do uh, going forward. We also contributed the Ministry of Planning heavily to the Sustainable Development Goals of the United Nations and we were very strong participants in that. I went up to the United Nations, the Honorable Prime Minister went up to the United Nations and gave strong commitments to those things. You would remember that the Prime Minister, Mrs. Kamala Prasad Bisesta, also established a Ministry of the Environment separate and distinct from the Ministry of Planning and Sustainable Development. So the environment was always high on the agenda and for us environmental considerations and conservation ecological considerations and the vitality and importance of that all of those things remain very committed to us and if we were going forward we would be committed to the principles of sustainable development which means that you can't think about economic development alone economic development is important but you can't think of that alone you have to think about climate change and the environment, environmental conservation and ecological sustainability. That is important. You have to think about the development of people at the center because what is the use of development if it is not sustainable for the individuals and families who live in your community? And you have to think about the communities and their own sustainability so that as change comes, you do not take away the authenticity of things that make these communities vital and valuable. So it's a mixture of economic progress involving investment, development, but also creativity, innovation, etc. And we're moving away from fossil fuels into greener industries that are sustainable, what you what you might call ecologically sensitive and uh, renewable industries. So that is a very big and important part of our plan and strategy. Uh, we are also talking about community development and sustainability. We are talking about uh, people's livelihoods and their own sustainability. And we are also talking about the environment in the large sense and protecting. We would be very interested 
and committed to doing things such as these, which we have done, which we did when we were there, but which we would now emphasize in a very serious way. First of all, no quarrying on the hills. And when they quarry on the hills, what they do is that they allow the mud and slush, etc., to come around the rivers. They silt up the rivers and they cause flood, flooding. So we'd have to deal with quarrying on the hills. We had a policy for no hillside development above the 300 foot contour, and we would continue that policy uh, so that people will not build apartments and homes, etc., on the hills and cause additional problems. We would be very strong on town and country planning management of the system to allow for uh, communities and homes, starting with HDC related things, to be done properly so that you have sustainable communities and developing. We would promote the idea of rainwater harvesting and solar energy in homes and in developments, especially with HDC developments. And we would promote green building for high rises as we did with buildings around the Savannah. We approved three buildings that were um, actually met the highest global standards of environmental acceptability. And those buildings are now around the Savannah, but they were passed in our times. And the investors who built those buildings were committed to environmental considerations. The, um, the new mall in Corinth, um, C3, is it? I, I remember. That new mall, for instance, was we asked them to introduce some elements of solar and rainwater harvesting into their system, which they did, so that, you know, we will really do those things. And we would have um, programs in which the schools can become involved in tree planting, in which the community can be, for, be involved in tree plant, planting and reforestation. And we would be very, very interested in developing community parks and water retention centers, etc., that could become ecologically and environmentally sustainable and friendly um, systems that help to enhance the value of life in the communities. Anything else? That's it. I want to thank you very much for listening to me this morning. Um, I hope the rest of your week is wonderful. And no matter what the challenge is, remember you have a voice and you have a vote. You have a voice to say what you feel, how you feel. You have a voice to express what you think and what you think should, should be done. And you have a vote which can determine who governs and how people govern. And you have a chance now in local government. I hope that you will express yourself fully and come out first of all and exercise, ex ex exert your, exercise your right to vote. And I hope that at the end of the day, when you look at everything, you will realize that it makes sense to vote for the UNC. And I hope you will vote for the UNC and the candidate in your particular area. First of all, to send a signal to the government about how you feel and how dissatisfied you are. And secondly, to give an impetus to the UNC because the UNC also needs to transform in order to govern this country well. I want to thank all the members on the radio station 97.5 who joined me and 97.5 and the managers for allowing me this opportunity and facility. And thank you for listening to me. I hope you found the program valuable and interesting. Thank you very, very much. Have a great day and a great week.